Welcome back guys, we're at um, part two of our engine teardown of the Meteor, our 27 litre Rolls-Royce V12. Uh, we're just in September now, it's actually the day after um, the Queen's death, so um, rest in peace the Queen. Kind of appropriate I guess with this, it's a British engine and you think maybe in her mechanical um, <laughs> yeah, no, she was a, she might have enjoyed. She, she was trying to do everything she could to help at the time and she was, yeah. she was learned to drive trucks and uh, and work on them and maintain yeah, them, you know. Yeah. Anyway, so this is where we are, about four months after the first video, and we didn't think it would be this popular. So there's been over 75,000 views now, and over 3,000 of you have subscribed and want more, so that's really, really good. The feedback's been overwhelming, the comments. Um, we've had information sent from some local guys in Australia and other people around the world and museums um, to get in contact with that could also help us and be interested in the outcome of this engine. So. That's fantastic, and that sort of motivated us, I guess, to try and push this along and get into it again. This is sort of in between our workshop uh, duties that we have, which this has nothing to do with, uh, where we do BMWs and motor vehicles. But Tony, what do you reckon? We're gonna just do a little bit what we can today. We don't have a lot of time, but uh, we wanna glaze over a few things that people are interested in hearing about and uh, where we're up to. Yeah, well, we've made, you know, we haven't really done much uh, since the last um, video, but we'd probably look at trying to get some of the ancillary um, accessories off the ends. Um, we've learnt that, uh, and several people have commented, <laughs> this is a complicated process uh, that you need to take care of as far as removing the cylinder locks and the cylinder heads as one unit. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's sort of going to hold us up a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, Where... we don't have the support plate. Um, that we need to store or transport or, or um, you know, um, hold the, the assembly on once we remove it. Um, so we're, we're looking for that plate, um, even a drawing for one that we could make. Uh, we don't want to do things that, that are going to uh, cause any problems uh, down the track, so we want to do it the right way. And now we've got some, some really good manuals too that uh, we've been supplied with. Well, right, let's cut the intro and then we'll go have a look at the, what's on the computer yeah. there and have a look at some diagrams. Yeah. Oh yeah? It's a tank, there's a rock. <laughs> yeah. A this is a message I received from a local guy in Victoria and he was one of the first to reach out and show us some stuff that he's got in his possession. He actually has a, a physical hard copy manual with some information here of special tools for these 27 litres. As you can see, there's a, a, a guide plate here that replicates the, the crankcase so that when we take the cylinder block and head off, we can slide it onto here and retorque it so that the, the case doesn't warp. So we believe this is something that we really need. If anyone can help us with this, a drawing that we can make one or, or buy one or, or, or borrow one, that'd be fantastic. There's obviously a, a whole bunch of special tools here that this manual shows and we believe that there was a wooden case with all these in it that would be issued for any maintenance to be done on the engine. There's all part numbers here and spanners and tools related, lifting hooks and all this stuff would be handy but we'll have to make some of it where we can or obtain some of the important parts. So if anyone can help with that that'd be great but thanks very much for old mate sending us that. We'll be in touch with him again I'm sure and see what else he can help us with. Tony, what do you got over here? You've got some of the manuals. Uh, yeah. Colin from Mildura, actually, down here in yeah. Victoria, or in Australia from Victoria. Good work, Colin. Um, Thank you very a, much. Yeah, really handy stuff. Um, it's all Merlin related. Uh, they're Merlin documents, but it doesn't matter. We can use that because it's a base. It's based on the Merlin um, engine. So this one, this one here is an engine uh, maintenance manual to cover quite a few uh, Merlin uh, versions. And this document's dated December 46. So this is post-war. So I guess all of the information that was gathered and you know the improvements and revisions uh, are included in this manual. Um, it's it's a really comprehensive document. It's 104 pages. Uh, so this is one one you know really really useful piece of information that we can use. Now the other document, I mean this is quite quite extensive with all the details in here. The other documents also really interesting. It's got some great you know, diagrams, and these were all hand-drawn, you know, if you think about the era. 
Um, here's just a view of, of a Merlin oil circuit, and it's four, actually four oil circuits here. with a high pressure circuit, a main pressure circuit, a low pressure circuit, and scavenge oil, of course, being an aircraft engine, you've got to scavenge the oil into a, into a reservoir, because we can be inverted and have oil problems. <laughs> Our tank engine pro isn't as extreme, or no. does, it doesn't need these considerations as much, but we're, let, we're yet to confirm what, what it actually has and, and hasn't got. Now this document is an earlier document, and it's dated May 1938. So this is pre-war. It's a pre-war document um, for Merlin Aero Engines Series 2. Now it was subsequently um, revised and reprinted in, in June 41. So I think things had really started to hot it up, hot up at the time, you know, the war was in full swing. So this is an interesting document. And this one's 182 pages in total. Um, so it's just a gold mine of information. It's a shame we don't have a Merlin. <laughs> well, maybe we need but, to get one next, but it's yeah. certainly going to be helpful for this one, isn't it? Oh, it's so interesting and so fascinating. Um, you know, my early background is to do with engines that uh, had a fork and blade Conrad arrangement, and we'll show that later. But for those that know, um, this is a really interesting design of engines. Uh, so we noticed the difference between the documents, didn't we? The 38 document explained one specific thing to do in a certain order and then... I, I just had a quick glance because we're yeah. looking at that cylinder case, the cylinder block removal, and I think the early document, it could be the other way around, but uh, the early document indicates that you should start to loosen the, the, the main through studs down to the crankcase from the inside and work your way out when you're loosening. Right. Which sort of contradicts what... I've been taught over the years, but then the later document, the post-war document, is the reverse. They say, no, start at the outside and work in. Um, so, yeah. So they must have learnt something, possibly, in that maybe, time. Maybe, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not, yeah. I'm not sure, but uh, anybody that's got any ideas on that little detail, I know it's trivial, but uh, that's what we're about. We're talking about engines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. the more information, the better. Yeah. So our biggest concern at the moment is we take the valve gear off, we can undress the engine a little bit further, that's great, we'll be fine with that but then we have to take the head and the cylinder block off. We, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that point where we stop until we get that plate or no yeah. more. So if there's any other experienced guys out there that know what they're doing and can advise us, that'd be great. So yeah, we, let's get, we can get the camshafts off, we can get the rocker gear off, I'm pretty happy with that. There's, a, there's quite a large number of castle nuts here with split pins in them. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I haven't read yet, but someone mentioned, I think, in the feedback that uh, the castle nuts are indexed with a numbering or a lettering system so that when you torque the nut to the required torque, if the hole doesn't line up with the split pin, you don't, you don't over torque or under torque, you select a different castle nut, which is the thread is indexed in a different way, right. so that when it does reach the right torque, the hole is exposed and the split pin feeds through without uh, incorrect torquing on the nut. I think, I think, we will confirm that later, I'll do some more reading. Yeah. I want to see, I want to clean one of these nuts and see if there's any kind of identification on the nut, like a number or a letter. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yep, that makes sense. Another, more interesting stuff, you know, it's quite good. So we can take all this, um, all this accessory belt um, tensioning. Watch your fingers. Yeah, this is a... It's a guillotine. It's a, it's a guillotine, this one. So this, um, there's two here, there's uh, one on either side. And they're, they're, these are the automatic self-tensioners uh, for the belts. Um, so we'll, we'll start to disassemble this and the drive here, this gear case here. So they, these pulleys here are actually drive <coughs> pulleys, aren't they? And they're connected via a gear set to yeah, the crank. It looks that's like, why yes, that's, that's exactly. engaged to something, which that's I right. assume is the crankshaft. Yes, yeah. Well, crank centered lines down here. There'll be an idler gear here. And there's and a gear box in And that'll feed these two, these two gears in this gear case. So we'll, these will come off fairly quickly. They're quite straightforward. And then we go and get a little bit more deeper into the gear case. And like I said, top end here. Um, and then at the other end, if we pan around here, uh, we can do other accessories here. So we can this water pump assembly here. Once we've got the water pump out of the way, we can think about uh, the magnetos on, on either side, this one and this one, and all of the associated cabling that ran to the spark plugs. And we'll keep all those as complete units and put them aside for later. Uh, and that'll probably do, you know, both most of our accessory gear off, and, and that's the point where we'll do another video uh, later on. So that's what we're trying to achieve today, if we can. Oh, what's this? <laughs> what's that? Oh, yeah. Good point, Tony. So someone in the comments said, oh, have you checked your little canister at the end of the cylinder to see all the documents inside? It's like a maintenance history, I think. This thing. It? Was it a service history or something that he said? What was it? Um, what did he say? Possibly the assembly or service history. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's here. I haven't actually pulled it off yet. I didn't know. I, I didn't notice it. it. I didn't, I, you I didn't, didn't know yeah, about. I didn't, I didn't, know, I didn't know about yeah. it. And I saw it, and I thought, this thing's not connected to anything, and it's just in a little what spring is it? clip. Yeah. What is it? So, so yeah. I, I mean, I've had a bit of a look to see. It looks like it pops off here. I don't want to break it. Okay, so there's a little. It looks like there's something it's in there. Like it's going nowhere. <laughs> what are they? Have a look. What do you think? It's probably got some writing under the under the cosmoline there. There's something there. We'll clean it up and see what it actually says. It may actually say something. I can see some writing. C E R something T maybe possibly. We'll clean it up. Yeah, give it a clean. Oh yeah, something certificate. Replace certificate. Let's clean it. Guess this cosmoline. Oh well. Uh, so I can read something a little bit already. Uh, replace certificate container after use. To open pull container from clip. Replace, Done that. Yeah, replace certificate um, and container or something container after use. Okay. Maybe it's just duplicated on the other half there. So is that screwing open, is it? Right. Something turned. Um, modification cert certificate contained. Oops. Container. There you go. Modification certificate container. Okay, so as, as time goes by, there's, uh, there's a number on the end of it. So if you make changes or modify it, gets updated and yeah. put in there so okay. that the latest is known. Oh, well, it looks like it just splits apart, just threaded, threaded or something. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right, oh, it's a tank engine, so <laughs> there's a cartridge in here. Okay. <laughs> but no certificate. We're empty. Okay. Well, someone's been there, obviously, and um, or it never had one in there, um, which I don't know. I, I, th I think there probably would have been something in there. Someone's put a Winchester 243. Oh, right. I don't know what that is. Okay. No, well, it's not a military <laughs> cartridge. <laughs> yeah. Very good, very good. So, Commonwealth. Uh, forces, as far as I know, the standard small arms, um, you know, like infantry round was the 303 British, which saw service over many decades. And then they adopted, uh, you know, during World War II, there were other things adopted for heavy machine guns like the 50 BMG, of course, which are, I guess some tanks were equipped with. So um, no document in there? No, nothing, nothing at all. But That's I, a shame. this valley's quite dirty, you know, when we, when we took that, um, the valley cover off the carburetor in the manifold last time I looked in here and I saw lots of debris and rock and sticks and things like that. Um, which indicates to me this tank probably was in service and, you know, active and um, that's why all this debris is collected up in here from all the, uh, you know, the off-road, the, the terrain driving. And then uh, we bought the engine, you, you, you saw the engine advertised as a reconditioned and preserved engine. So I'm probably... Well, it was, the, the, I think... The gentleman alleged that it was under his knowledge. Yeah. Um, maybe from where he got it from, he was told that. Yeah. But yeah. you know, obviously, we don't. Yeah, we don't have any any record now. We've got numbers that we'll show uh, as well um, in still shots, probably, um, and with all the uh, uh, numbers on the on the cylinder case and the cylinder heads, and maybe someone can identify what those numbers mean. And um, but I think what's happened is that I don't think it's actually been reconditioned. I think it was probably in service, taken out of service. Um, preserved with all this cosmoline, um, with covers off, and then and then stored, um, and that's probably why that might, might explain why there's all this debris in here. Because if I was to recondition an engine, I wouldn't leave it like this. It, obviously, it would, everything would have been cleaned and. So it's probably really a known clean. good running engine. That's why yeah. they've gone to the effort of preserve. Well, we'll shelve it because it's mm. okay. Yeah. But yeah. that's why we're going to pull it apart, isn't it? That's that? right. We, we don't know. We, we can make the, the sort of a rough assumption that well, it could have been in service. They've just taken it out of service. They've preserved it and put it away. But we'll see. All right, let's get some gear off the front of this and expose yep. the shape of it. Yep. It's starting to look good. It's just this nut. Oh, 
pressure. Okay, that should just lift off now. It'll be under tension a bit, so that'll just slide off there and off here. No, it doesn't. It doesn't feel like a lot. Okay. So yeah, it, it did extend a, a little bit, but just to play it safe, we tried to capture it. Um, so just, with this, Tony, people have commented and, and we agree this stuff here is going to be a bit of a, a mess to try and get off. But we've got a solution for that, don't we? Hmm. So we've got yeah, a little heat, bit. heat source. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we'll we'll demonstrate the purpose of um, a machine we have to help with this. We'll see how that turns out shortly. Hmm. So that's not real tight, is it? I loosened it. Oh, you did. It's actually taking the bolt with it, I think. Oh, the whole thing is it? Mm -hmm. oh, well, there we go. Hang on, just slide it off here. All right, there's the other tension. Exposed. We've got a little bit more we can see. Maybe we can pop this line off. That must be a lubrication system for the gear train in there, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, it comes off of like a distributor, uh, sort of a manifold or a housing on the side here, and then feeds up to the front. And yeah, it's likely to be a little spray um, where these two gears spin inside the gear case here, I'd say. And a lot of this stuff here, uh, uh, you can see down in here, if you pan down in there, these nuts have lock tabs on them, every single one. So there's a lot of security, you know, and it's an old, older uh, technology to have these lock tabs everywhere and these split pins through all the castle nuts. Obviously, you don't see any of that on modern machinery. Uh, but this is how it was done, and it's quite labour intensive at the time, but they needed the security. We were lucky we had someone with some um, old British Imperial tools that we've got <laughs> because none of our tools fit this old, you know, uh, English uh, um, nut sizes and threads and things. I've got my special tool. It's Ooh, a yeah. Bunning Stanley shifter. Uh, you know, so here's some trivia. The, the actual the slang word, not the official word for this spanner, like an adjustable wrench or a shifting spanner or I think in New Zealand they just used the, the trademark Crescent. Oh yeah, okay. Because <laughs> that's the first one they saw and they said, oh, this is called a crescent. Um, in German, they call this type of spanner an Englander. It's an English spanner. <laughs> Here, conventional split spring washer that most people are familiar with. No lock tabs. No, no um, split pins on this one. So what have we got here? I've got... Uh, well, this one's a dual size. It's it's a quarter BS, which would be one that's British standard, and it's also 3 16 Whitworth. It comes off nicely. So am I splitting this case? Are we, is well, well, the aim I think, to undo this? I think we need to because uh, I can't see it any other way to get, there's no access from behind. Well the rear of that case is part of this isn't it? Um, no that separates it away okay, yep. from here and I can't see anything that's actually from the outside of here that's attaching the rear part of the case to the main, this main housing here. So I'm assuming that whatever's holding the rear of the case, rear of the case to there, is under this cover. So we've got. Okay. You know, I mean, we could probably read those manuals, Tony. Well, yeah, and yeah. Just yeah. Oh, get definitely. The direction, but if all is... else fails, read the book. They well, say. <laughs> but that's not much fun, is it? So we've got to just, uh, just well, undo bolts. Well, yeah, but within reason. We... Yeah. So that was a three sixteen Whitworth. I assume the three sixteen means the diameter of this bolt. Yeah, I'd say so. All I remember about Whitworth was that the thread profile of the Whitworth, the standard Whitworth thread profile was considered the best. 
um, because of its uh, uh, low stresses, like in the root of the thread, there's a nice generous radius and also on the peak as well. So, and I think it was a 55 degree flank on the thread profile. So uh, I've just read that technically, you know, as far as a thread profile goes, because there's quite a few. It does look like it's got a nice... Yeah, the Whitworth was the one, but of course it's died, uh, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, others have taken over. Um, and which is good, uh, good in a way. We need a standard for everything, you know. There's no good having 50,000 varieties or something. We no. don't need to. But the Whitworth one would have been, been good to be prevail oh, because it's... of that... Uh, the actual design of the thread. Well, the way that wound off and feel like it, mm. as old as it is, felt good compared to modern things we undo daily. I here. think some of the some of the heritage that you see from British engineering in the past is some of the best, you know. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, that's what makes this a lot more interesting than the mm. normal stuff we work on, isn't it? Yeah. Well, BMW saw the saw the light, there, didn't they? They have acquired Rolls Royce cars. <laughs> I've got a little, you know, over the years I've had little links and heritage uh, to Rolls Royce as well. My grandfather's brother had possession of a Rolls Royce at some time in the 1930s or 40s, a car, which they send, he retired and moved to Poole with his sons and opened a, a garage repair business. I've been to Poole, it's a beautiful place. Okay. And they, had to, they needed a tow truck to um, you know, use for the, for the business, the garage. And so they looked at the Rolls Royce and they said, this is perfect, big, heavy, powerful, torquey car. Full chassis vehicle, so they, if you pan over here, Nat, here's a photo of it. They basically did some, some quite serious modifications to the rear of the vehicle and took the rest of the body off and kept the front part and they fitted a manually operated um, crane there to pick up cars and tow them back to the garage. Yeah. Rumour has it that Rolls-Royce caught, caught onto this, someone had notified them. <laughs> And some of my distant relatives, apparently, uh, back in the UK, have an official letterhead uh, letter sent from Rolls Royce complaining about what had been done to their vehicle. <laughs> Customised, uh, but for a purpose. Curious to know if that vehicle is still in existence. Um, it would be really, really something to, to track down one day. Maybe we'll do something in the future about that too. <laughs> also, I also had to do a job. I was working in the UK for a few years. And I had to do a job. I was in Leeds uh, at the time doing it on, on a site, commissioning a, um, a, pump, a fire pump engine for a gas rig, uh, an offshore gas rig. And um, I got a phone call um, asking if I could uh, urgently go down to crew to Rolls Royce. This is before the split up of the company. And um, <laughs> I said, sure. <laughs> so I made my way that afternoon down to crew. Um, apparently, a division of Rolls Royce. At the time, was called Vickers Speciality Engines. Vickers is an old English name; a lot of people will have heard. And they were producing um, some gensets, uh, some diesel, diesel generator um, pack sets for um, a naval vessel that was destined for some Middle Eastern country, I think. Okay. And uh, the engines had been supplied without any any, um, any speed governor droop in the genset, and that was required on this one. And they didn't know how to adjust it, and um, I did. <laughs> so I made an express trip down to crew that afternoon, picked the guys up from Vickers, and we came around to the main gate in the Rolls Royce factory. It was just mind blowing. Wow. This old brickwork and the, the wrought iron gates, and the, it's just class, you know, the whole thing. Is and it still there today? I, I, I don't know. This is a long, you know, quite a few years ago. And then these guys in the car just go straight through and they wave to the guard on the gate. They, they knew him and, and knew just him, waved yep. them through. And we drove right through the whole facility, right to the very back, to the disused foundry area, where they would have cast, you know, a lot of castings back in the old days. And this is the area they were using to assemble these gensets in there. So it was just uh, an amazing thing just to drive through and see all the old buildings and, and uh, the factory itself. You could see some of the cars inside the doors, you know, in different stages of assembly. Oh, okay. Well. Wow. And uh, then we got there and we got out and I showed them what to do and made the adjustment and, and we, they loaded up and there was a speed differential with load versus no load. Um, and they said, great, fantastic, great, we know what to do now, we can carry on. Right, let's go. And then out we went and that was it. That was my <laughs> brief uh, visit to the factory and it was just a mind-blowing thing. So. I'd be very interested to know if anyone knows in the UK if that's still there or? What's that? The, 
Oh, the building, the Rolls Royce building. The, oh, the original yeah. at Crew, the Crew um, factory. I, yeah, it'd be interesting because I would assume it'd be heritage listed. Uh, I would anyway. <laughs> I would. Yeah. From what yeah. I saw, in those buildings have got a lot of history there. So, be that'd be something to to study or research or produce a you know like a, um, a historical record of some kind of book or video. Yeah. On the on the history of the of the facility, the location, and the, and all of the th things that went on there. I'd read it. Uh, yeah, it'd be really interesting. Okay, Lawrence, this answers the question on what's behind the cover. All right, what do you got? I've got a cylindrical roller bearing, and I've got a, a castellated nut, and a looks like a lock tab arrangement here as well. You can see there's a there's a keyway in the in the shaft, and that would be, be for the lock washer uh, to lock onto the shaft on the inner side, and then the outer side would be where the tab's bent over. There's one over I think here, here I can it, see. yeah, where it's bent over. Yep. And to prevent any again, it's an anti anti vibration. Uh, and are we undoing that? Do you think, or not at this stage? Uh, Maybe wait until we see that we need to. I I think what'll What's possible is that the because it'll be a you know just a straight wall um, outer uh, race on the bearing there that that would you know the cover would maybe slide off here but on the other hand uh, maybe not oh the other side's interesting too the other side um, where this is driving through to is the pulley now the pulley's got some other little uh, screws in here securing it and they're lock wired you can see there's a hole drilled through the center of it. And they've intricately wired, like a lot of aircraft or race type uh, fasteners, they have had this safety wire between two fasteners so that, again, that's another anti-loosening slash vibration precautionary measure that they've done there. And so intricate, all this work, labour intensive. Right? Yeah, that means we have to do all this when we put it back together, yes, right? Yes, of so course. It's, uh, <laughs> we're going to be... We're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some new craftsmanship will be learned on my behalf. <laughs> I think I've got I've got a wire spinner, a safety wire spinner okay. somewhere. Yeah. Very good. So I've been listening, Tony, to a, an audio book called The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. All right. It's 57 hours. Oh. I think it's written by a, a guy named William Shearer, who was at first hand um, involved in the Nazi Germany side of the war right. and wrote his accounts and everything that he saw. Um, I've just gone past a part, I think we're at 40 hours in, and they said that in Russia, the German tanks failed compared to the Russian tanks when the winter came in. Right. So they had to light fires under the tanks. Yeah, to um, warm the oil. To yeah. warm the oil and mm. the fuel. Fuel mm. was frozen yep. just to get them running. Right. And then it got to the point where in Russia it was minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit and that didn't work anymore. Yep. They couldn't get the engines to run at all. Right. The cannons wouldn't fire, the machine guns were jammed. And that's where the uh, all the Russian equipment was superior. Their machinery and what, the Russians are still out in that weather, wanting to, wanting to play in these temperatures. I believe. I so. thought everybody would be inside somewhere, uh, huddled around a fire. I think they're a pig in mud when it's like that. <laughs> oh, it's... okay. Which uh, Is brings some me antifreeze the... in their blood or something. Oh, maybe. In but the yeah, form I... of a clear liquid. I just found it, it interesting with, that with v. You know, lighting fires <laughs> under the tank to yeah, just yeah. To try anything. Yeah, to I think in, it was... in that sort of weather, I th I've heard of being done under trucks as well. And yeah, okay. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Which brings me on to another point. There's a, a comment we had recently from a, I think he's from Russia. Uh, he's got a V12 tank engine. Um, I think it's from the T55, he said. Right. It's a diesel. Okay. And it was used in a lot of industrial machines and apparently they're plentiful and uh, not too badly priced if you want to source one over there. Okay. So um, I'm very interested in that engine that I've had a quick look into it. And well, that would be great to make a comparison, you know, and talk about the eras that it was produced versus the, this and yeah. then see, yep. just make the comparison there. Yeah. And, and I love my diesel engines. Yeah. Um, There'd be pluses and minuses, I guess, with each one. Yep. But I mean, they've all ended up diesels um, these days, of course. Um, yeah. But uh, yep. yeah, at the time, what were the reasons why they were still using petrols uh, versus a diesel and things like that? Yeah. So it'd be interesting, yeah. Yeah. You've got a, a diesel engine item here, don't you, somewhere from a, <laughs> another tank engine? Yeah, I used to be involved a little bit with uh, uh, very, well, these days you could say it's a very early version of um, 
an advanced tank that I believed it was at the time, and that was the, the tank produced by the German company Kraus Maffei, and it's the Leopard 1, um, which was the, you know, the first version of the Leopard. The Leopard 2 is still in production. It's a quite a well-regarded tank, and the power plant's very highly regarded. Uh, but the earlier Leopard 1 didn't have that current, uh, the, the 880 series MTU engine. It ran the earlier uh, 838 CAM500 engine, which was a V10. So is that the... That was the one you were showing me the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. A, a piston, V10 piston you've got. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I've got a piston out of one. Um, I've been trying to clean it. Oh, you got it handy? <laughs> in the ultrasonic. I've had it in the ultrasonic for a while, trying I've, to clean it up. I've been listening to that ultrasonic <laughs> machine over the last few days. Yeah, I've, away, been, so yeah I've, I've been trying to... That's, that's what you've been... Yeah, this is what I've been doing with it. Yeah, so, okay. um, yeah, this is this is the piston from the 838, the Leopard 1. Um, it's an all alloy construction. We've got two oil rings and three compression rings. Uh, you can see the valve cutouts in the crown and obviously a little depression with a central injector. Uh, so what, is that a, a ring land there as well? Yeah, yeah. So we've got two oil rings um, on these, which was not uncommon uh, for older engines. Uh, but these aren't really, well, I guess in the big picture of things, that old. I think you know, these were sort of developed in the 60s and ran up until uh, you know, into the 80s. Um, so that's an MTU engine, a diesel V10? Yes, now, but I do believe that the origins, the very early origins of this 838 engine were from Mercedes-Benz or Daimler. Um, because I think I've seen pictures of the early ones with uh, on the rocker covers on the early ones had a Mercedes-Benz star on it. And then, you know, subsequently then it became a, uh, an MTU engine. But there was a transition over time. When the original um, MTU engine company, before it was MTU, it was a family company and this was uh, originated from Wilhelm Maybach and then his son Karl Maybach and so this was, this, the company name was Maybach Motorenbau. Uh, so the two M's, you know, you've got the two M's overlaid there. Now there's a Mercedes-Benz luxury version of the S-Class that is the Maybach. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, well, so that's, that that's, that's in recognition of the heritage of the Maybach family, family okay. business and Daimler. Uh, Wilhelm Maybach used to work for Gottlieb Daimler. Okay. Uh, yeah, apparently he was a difficult boss. Right. Uh, what, from what I've read, but yeah, and uh, Maybach wasn't—he wasn't, he wasn't uh, like that. He was more a, an astute sort of a, an engineer, um, and just sort of basically come up with some brilliant engineering. Okay. Um, and so, but when when the when the family uh, sort of you know faded away when Carl died, there was a, a a merger of the company, and so I think it was split roughly into three parts. I I, I have to check it. So the Maybach family retained a third or some portion. Um, MAN took another portion and Mercedes-Benz or Daimler took the other portion. And that's where the integration of all their products came together. And that, that's what MTU actually stands for in German. It's, it stands for the Motoren und Turbinen Union. <laughs> so translated, it basically means the engine and turbine union. Okay. Because the turbine part of the business is with the aero side of the business. So there's aero engines involved. And this was MTU Munich. Now, since, since, since that merge, I think it was the late 60s or early, early 60s or around the 50s, 60s, um, it's since changed a lot. All those companies have been sold or they're public companies or acquired by other companies. But at the time, that was the merger. Now, the aircraft engine side of it was in Munich. And this was the old, and here's this other link that we kept coming back to. This was the old BMW aero engine plant. This is BMW Rolls. link, and we're coming back and yep. here at the Rolls Royce again, and it all was like a big circle. Yep. So the BMW engine plant became uh, part of the MTU uh, uh, group. Um, On the aircraft side. Yeah, so aircraft engines, uh, typically the gas turbines, and so that's where the turbine, the turbine, you know, this motoren on turbine, and the motoren or the engine side was the Maybach engines, um, which, well, this was the MTU, yep. um, and this is uh, uh, located and centred in Friedrichshafen which is in, on the Lake Constance uh, in southern Germany in the state of Baden-Württemberg. And that's near the border of what country's under there? Uh, so on the other side of the lake, predominantly, you've got the uh, Swiss coastline. Yep. Then you've got the, the German coastline on one side. And it's sort of on a little bit of an angle. So on the southeastern corner, there's an Austrian coastline as well. <laughs> yeah, right. So you need so your passport. Well, you did. <laughs> if you're travelling on the lake, you carry a passport with you. Passport depending on where you, where you land. It's a beautiful place. Uh, and I've wor I worked there for a, a short time. So well. do you think we can get our hands on one of these engines to pull apart? Oh, I don't know. It'd be the, very, it'd be diesel really... V10 sounds interesting. Oh, so. it was an interesting engine. It really was. They had a bit of a, an Achilles heel. Um, okay. 
The crankcase was aluminium, oh. the cylinder heads were aluminium. You were telling me about this. And so were the main bearing caps. Mm. And that was the problem. Yep, okay. The main bearing caps deformed and wouldn't hold a, a circular form uh, over time. And so you had problems with those main bearing caps. And all of the, all of the components were hard anodised to, to, you know, uh, toughen up that. the yep. surfaces. Um, wasn't enough though. Yeah, it just wasn't enough. And they had an interesting... Uh, um, uh, charge air boosting uh, system. It was a mechanically driven. They had two mechanically driven superchargers on them. They weren't roots types. They were centrifugal um, conventional um, turbines. Okay, so like a standard turbine compressor housing. Exactly. Like if you look at a standard turbocharger these days, you look at the compressor. That's what it looked like, and it was driven from the gear train, um, but it wasn't directly driven. So when engine speed increased and decreased, it wasn't a, uh, a fixed ratio. There was like a, uh, it was a coupling arrangement in between and it was a drive system where there was a star driven from the gear train inside a, a steel drum and captured in inside each segment of the star was something between seven or eight hundred, I can't remember exactly, uh, steel ball bearings. Right. And as the star increased in speed, uh, the ball bearings were centrifuged out into the drum and then gave drive to the compressor. Right. And it, it went like that. Okay, so yeah. boost would increase with RPM essentially. Yeah, but not directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on yeah. the sliding scale yeah. of yeah. some sort. Yeah, due to the centrifugal uh, oh, uh, drive system. Yeah, it was. It was uh, interesting. So we had to weigh all the ball bearings, yeah. you know, on a scale accurately, so that they're all balanced. Each segment had exactly the same weight of, of balls in there to, to uh, centrifuge around. Just you know, the quirky things. Okay. And that's why I, I like that quirkiness, these unusual designs that engineers have come up over the years and why they did it's another curious thing and how did it work? Was it successful? Was it a better option than what else was around at the time? You know, that's, that's, that's if you're interested in engines, which we sort of are. We sort of are. That's why I <laughs> asked these diesel V10s and Russian yeah. diesel V12s. I think you know, we're always thirsty to learn. And um, if we say something wrong, we'll get something wrong or we assume something wrong, then... Please, oh. you, we're here to learn, correct yeah. us. Call. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're, we're yeah. not here to pretend that we know anything we don't. We're just trying to bring up topics of conversation and, you know, yeah. join in and, and speak this is, with this us. This is our hobby. You know, yeah. So, yeah, we just, yeah. we love engines. And yeah. anyway, so I've taken the front bracket off this gear case here and um, you can see a, a definitive line there now, Tony, because it's nice and clean. Yep. Um, that's obviously where we're going to split that split. open. Yeah. We may on. have to take these pulleys off. I don't know yet. There might be something under there. I, I can't yeah. see, but let's see how far we go. We might continue. Start, we might start to read. There might be a breakdown. There probably is in that uh, the bigger document on uh, the breakdown. Although having said that, this is not a Merlin. No. Well, we don't have a meteor document. If someone has a meteor, a tank meteor document, perfect. Oh yeah. Oh, that would be. We'd love that it. would be yeah. very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But Merlin's a lot more common. It seems to be that there. people have more of them, um, you know, documents and engine parts and things, although I think there was a, a, a high number of these produced. Um, there seems to be less uh, enthusiasm, if you like, for the media or compared, yeah. to, compared to the Merlin. I'm not saying that people aren't enthusiastic about them. Well, just on that, um, our friends in Sweden have left us a comment. Uh -huh. They've got a twin turbo Meteor in a I think it's an American car. Um, oh, a the, rat rod. The Vic, uh, what is it? Vic Crown? Okay. I, I don't know. It's a car. It's, it's, I think it's called a Vic Crown. They've got a twin turbo uh, Meteor in that running. Right. <laughs> and they've said if you need any help. So maybe we ask them if they've got a, a document. Yeah, 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 they might have some They might have built yeah. an engine or two. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah guys, if, if, if you're watching this second well, yeah. video and you <laughs> want to help us with any Meteor specific documents, please. Yeah. Because um, ideally we would like to get it running one day. Well, we, yeah, yeah, we want to yeah, run it. Yeah. We'd like to run it on a stand to start with, make sure we haven't put it together wrong. Then ultimately put it in something and make it move under its own power. Yeah, That'd yeah. be the that ultimate would, yeah, goal. Yeah, yeah. And we'll film it and build it and share it and yeah, yeah. Anyway, we're we're kind of far off from that, so we need to. Well, um, that's but we've got something to to look forward to. We do, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's two. We've got two runs off each magneto, don't we? We've got yeah. a, um, we upper and lower cylinder harness. Yeah, but so each one, the one fires a leading and a trailing is plug plug so each um where it splits one will go to one bank and the other one goes to the other bank so they're all firing together so one magneto is responsible for both retarded and both advanced the other one firing. yeah one, one one does both retarded ones or the late firing ones and yeah. the other magneto does the early ones okay yeah. so they yeah that's what that crossover is isn't yeah, it? yeah yeah so that's where it branches out well actually this one goes to the other side all right so i've just taken this um this boss bracket off here which 
holds these hard lines to the end of the cylinder head and they're the fittings that went to our oil filter that used to sit up here. So we're going to remove this hard line now down to here just to give us some clearance to pull the magneto harness out. Your head there, Tony. Yeah. Oh, hang on. This is one of those. Um, this opens up, doesn't it? Oh, you split thing. There we go. It should just pop off. Oh, we've got oil leaks. That can go into our special machine section. That's going to be demonstrated shortly to clean that up. Yeah, so I'll just pull that over. There we go. Okay. Magneto and plug wire assembly. One of what two. Do you reckon? One of two. Fifteen kilos. Oh, ten. Yeah, probably. Probably somewhere around eight, maybe ten, maybe seven. And obviously, this is another little complicated um, component. Uh, um, I believe you need specialised gear to actually you know, do this up properly and so check what, it and drive it. When this it. turns, if I turn it that way, there's two shoes opening outward. Mm -hmm. So we're going to and then it. inward on that way. So that must be the we're set of centrifugal advance. Advance, possibly. Yep. And you've got your springs here on the side for. Um, come around into here. You'll see that. That's obviously your spring tension to set that up. I'd assume for how much mm -hmm. advance you can get at different RPM. And look, look at the serrations here between this flange and the. Oh wow. Well. The dry flange here. So that's and engaged. Little, and more little split pins on our castle nuts here. That looks brand new, doesn't it? Yeah, nice and clean. So that's been well preserved with whatever sealing surface that was. It looks like just a paper gasket. Yep. Yeah, no leak. It wasn't leaking or anything. So This is the one we just took off. This is our previous work. We, we removed basically the, the carburetors and inlet manifold out of the valley. And this is quite a heavy, substantial item, but you can see the design, design it had to be restricted because of the, the space available in here. And you've got water um, also in this part of the manifold, so you've got inlet manifold down here, inlet here, uh, and then you've got water manifold collection here and, and feeding up out of the heads and then into the thermostat housing uh, here with the front. <coughs> Now, someone, someone made no, uh, mention too, these small lines um, uh, around on in the inlet manifold here, these were for an ether system, cold starting system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So some people have mentioned that yeah. you connect onto there for, with a, an external fuel. There would have been an ether cartridge Charge. or a bottle or something, yeah, yep, yep. for cold starting. Okay. There, yep. So these, these items that come out in one piece, this, the magneto and electronic harness, these are a unit of breakdown, aren't they? So yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. a whole section. Major, major component breakdown. To deal with this and then individually. The sub assemblies and, after yeah. that, you know, okay. as a, or well, this is a sub assembly of the main engine, but yeah, so. Um, and we'll have to move into that once it's all apart, I guess. <clears throat> yes, yeah. yeah, in more detail. Yeah. But yeah, first things first, we get the. Get it all apart. Uh, as I said, our big problem is get doing, doing this right with the, the cylinder blocks yeah. slash head. I've actually assembly. emailed um, Vintage V12. Oh yeah, uh, Jose. Yeah. So if you ever see this, Jose, and you're watching, um, please, if you can help us with any direction on that cylinder case, um, boss, that we need to to put this onto. Um, we 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 understand you've probably got a lot of special tools, um, or whether you've had to make them or acquire them over the years. So you you know what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about these these things. Yeah. They're doing. They do a lot of. Rolls-Royce uh, aircraft uh, engines. Well, we want to do it properly, and yeah, we want to yeah. get the right advice from someone who knows. Oh, and yeah, from yeah. what we can see, he's probably the authority on these engines oh, in the he's world. He's got a lot of, lot of, um, lot of engines under his belt, yeah. um, and a good reputation. So, from what I've seen, so. And there's another gentleman in the UK. I watched a, a series called Plane Resurrection. I was talking to you about this the other day. Oh, yeah. 
he rebuilds some Merlin engines and some aircraft restoration and mm. flies them. So wow. he's a little engineering shop somewhere in the UK. He works with his daughter. And right. um, that's impressive. If, if you're watching yeah. and you can help, you know, please send us an email at um, look up Brintech Customs, our business, or um, leave us a comment and we'll get in contact with you. All right, well, let's continue and yep. then maybe clean some parts. Yep. more information around here, it looks like direction of rotation, something else under the Cosmoline there. And we'll get to see those mysteries once we clean it up. Well, speaking of cleaning, do you want to, you guys can follow us through to this little area we've got. Excuse all the mess. We're going to be leaving the clean room now. Tony, do you want to come and help us mm. with these bits? Yeah. So excuse all the mess here guys, there's a lot of other engine parts mm -hmm. laying around and so welcome to the wash pod. <laughs> this is our hot wash machine we use every day for our small engines and other general cleaning. We've got our water heated up to about 70 degrees Celsius. We can go to um, 80 if we need, but 70 is quite Quite useful. So this is just a, a water bath with a, a caustic soap, a powder soap in here. We'll give that a 10 minute spin. And we'll come back to you shortly. Alright, so this thing's about ready to stop. There we go. So that's been a 10 minute wash. Flip her open I'll and we'll see, see what we've got. Like. Yep. Wow. <laughs> look, new parts, look at this. Come and have a look. Maybe the steam might fog up yeah. the lens there. But so the heat, the heat's just basically melted off the Cosmoline. Yeah, so yeah. there's all the, the original paint colour showing there now. Mm. Turn them over, we can probably give them another wash. There's still a bit of residue on a, there. But I wonder if this is meant to be like this as far as the profile, or that's just a wear, a wear characteristic of the... Oh yeah. With the belt yep. on, the, on, the, on the roller, probably. Yeah. It's, it feels like it's probably deliberate because there's a fair think, bit of... Yeah, we don't know, but, there, but yeah, probably pr probably is. Yeah, we've got numbers there that are very clear to read now. So mm -hmm. an, an FV95133 is the, um, the part number for this hard line, this oil tube. That must yeah. be like a, an air bleed or a, a port for maybe putting a... Gauge. A pressure gauge yeah. or something yeah. onto it. Mm. Yeah, I reckon they could do with another five minutes, but I think you get the general idea. We can put all our hard <coughs> parts in here when they're disassembled, and yeah. um, that'll that'll uh, rip it off real quick. Yeah, nothing like automated cleaning. <laughs> oh yeah, no. Well, I'll close that, and we'll go back in and yeah. have a quick look around the engine and um, yeah. talk about what we're going to do next. So we're getting, yeah, these subcomponents are coming off. We've got both magnetos out now, you can see. Here we can see two, one each side, uh, diaphragm type fuel pumps. Uh, so there'll be a drive off some kind of eccentric uh, cam inside here. And it looks like we've got a manual lever here for uh, priming as well, for manually actuating the, uh, the diaphragm. Oh yeah, we've got Under one here. this side. Yeah, yeah, there's another exact same pump on the other side, so two pumps. Both pumps from the pressure side then, feeding up this line after the pump above here. You can see this line here now, and then they come to a single union, and that's the union that fed to both carburetors. We've got the volume required for, uh, being delivered by two diaphragm pumps. And that's a good redundancy thing too. If one di diaphragm was to fail, you're probably still, you're not going to stop. Get some flow happening. Yeah, still. the other one's still flowing. Uh, yeah, uh, some volume of fuel, yeah. Limp, yeah. limp home mode. Yeah, 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 that's another redundancy thing that's a, yeah. a definite benefit, yeah. All right, well, you can see the shape of the V-block there now coming together and exposing itself, getting to the exciting bits. Um, we're going to cut the episode here for today, Tony, and mm -hmm. um, I hope you guys have enjoyed. Next, we'll get rid of the water pump and some more of these lines and ciliaries from the front, and we'll probably take more of the, the manifolds off these heads and just get as much clearance as we can in preparation for 
stripping off the the valve train and yeah. and pulling these cases off and the yeah, heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, hopefully we can. Depending how quickly we get those parts, I think there's still another episode in pulling more apart. Oh yeah, we'll still get another quite a bit of work here to get it ready before and we take the cases off, and then. Uh, but we we won't. There won't be as long a break this time in the next video. <laughs> no, we're, we're definitely going to come back into this probably in the next week or so yeah. and, and do more. Yeah. Um, because we know that you guys want to see the exciting stuff, as do we. Some of this stuff just takes a lot of time. We think there's probably at least an hour and a half, two hours of just undoing all these castle nuts on both sides properly and getting all this off. We're not, um, we're not in a race, but we just understand it. Because of all this cosmoline and the clogging up of our tools and getting all these split pins out, it's, we just... Yeah. Just do it casually. There's no, there's no race here, so yeah, we just yeah. get to do it carefully. And we're not going to yeah. show all that. We'll no. sh show a few coming off, and then you guys will get to see us pulling, pulling the gear out. Hopefully. So yeah, that's it. Thanks again, guys, for watching, and yeah. hopefully you enjoyed this episode as much as the first one. Um, we're getting there slowly, and we'll see you all again real soon. We promise. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>